I'm Katie Brown, um, a primary lead teacher here at Green Town Montessori. And today we bring you the bridge between school and home, supporting independence. And I'm Olivia Powers. Um, I lead the Montessori and Me playgroups, um, parent-child class. Um, and we're just going to dive right in. Um, so I want to start uh, by sharing a Maria Montessori quote. Never help a child with a task at which he feels he can succeed. Um, this quote is going to be the framework and guiding light of our discussion here today. Um, and I'll just give a little outline. Katie and I are going to share some Montessori philosophy regarding the child's independence and some components of the Montessori curriculum that are greatly supported within the home environment as well. Um, and then we're going to share um, a few things that we use here at Greentown that can be introduced in the home as well. Um, so Katie will start by explaining the first plane of development. All right. Well, within the first plane of development, age, is, age zero to six, the first half, age zero to three, is known as the unconscious. And age three to six is the conscious part of that first plane of development. There's such a momentous amount of development that happens during the first plane of development um, because of the absorbent mind. The absorbent mind allows a child to soak in all that is necessary to develop as an individual in their specific culture. Just think and realize how children are fluent in their mother tongue before the age of three, whatever their first language is. Um, just think how quickly they learn to walk. They are soaking in impressions constantly during all of their waking hours and putting what they are absorbing into order. And so then we'll talk a little more later about how this environment tries to support and reflect that, um, that drive to put things into order and to make sense of everything. Our words and our mannerisms become part of the environment and that's part of their learning. The child in this plane of development is grounded in learning by concrete means the hand-to-brain connection, and gradually moving toward more abstract thinking. And the child in this plane has a strong drive for physical independence and for claiming autonomy. I hope that you notice this at home as well. The I can do it myself mentality expresses a deep need which can be satisfied in so many small, safe, and constructive ways when mindful adults are setting the stage. Uh, we've, you've probably heard the quote, Maria Montessori follow the child. But following the child doesn't mean that the child sets the agenda. Uh, we're going to follow the child in the sense of being keenly aware of their need for independence and look for ways to support that independence because they're showing us that they need it. Um, and this plan of development is characterized by sensitive periods. <laughs> so Maria Montessori observed windows of opportunity, known as sensitive periods, for learning where comprehension and understanding occurs with great ease. These sensitive periods include language, movement, small objects, a refinement of the senses, developing a sense of order, and social behaviors. It's important to remember that in fostering the child's independence, we are also helping them to be more intrinsically motivated, rather than always looking to others for validation, validation and completing tasks. Children are born with an innate tendency to learn where we as adults are truly oblivious to their inner drive or purpose. And you might find yourself asking, why are they doing that for the hundredth time? Um, we may wonder what a child is working on or why they're completing a task in a certain way that might be different from how we would complete that same task. Um, and as a result, we might be quick to interrupt when what we need to do is to step back and observe. We are allowing the child freedom to explore, to problem solve, and independently make their own discoveries. When we allow this to happen, we're giving them an opportunity to develop concentration, coordination, independence, and order. So as Katie mentioned, and for those that are here, I have a visual for those who are watching. <laughs> um, it'll be on the screen, I guess. Um, here is what we call the Montessori Triangle. This is the foundation of the Montessori method, where we are working together to move the child towards independence, diligence, and a love for learning. The child is respected as a competent, individual, independent being, 
and a member of their community at home and eventually were already at school, rather than being seen as an empty vessel needing to be filled. Typically in a traditional school setting, there's more of a top-down approach where the adult is imparting knowledge to the child. In Montessori, the adult is an observant guide. Um, as Katie mentioned, we always say follow the child. We are preparing the environment to meet those individual needs of the child. For example, a child who is showing great interest in reading or in a sensitive period for language indicates that it's time for us to introduce letter sounds um, and give them the freedom to practice, to take risks, and to make errors that they can then try again on their own. And then lastly, we have the environment. It is our job as the guide to connect the child with the materials as a gateway to discovery. Children do not develop in a void, but rather within a carefully prepared environment that meets their needs at each level of development in order to fully realize their potential. We always say freedom within limits. When given the freedom to move, nature and practice will then this learning occurs through the senses, so children are always using real functional materials, as you will see um, later in our presentation. Children have opportunities to wash ceramic dishes with real soap, or to arrange real flowers with water and scissors to cut the stems, or even preparing their own snack. Um, and now we're going to share what that looks like in the home environment. Well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about social emotional um, aspect of independence and also a little bit about language. Um, what we used to think of or refer to as soft skills are now really understood to be foundational skills acquired in early childhood. Things like communicating to get along, understanding and expressing our emotions effectively, and understanding that others have needs and rights and their own plans and their own wishes their own needs and pursuits. Montessori taught us to be careful that we not become a servant to the child um, because this would misrepresent the reality of the world they're growing up to become a part of and it can interfere with their drive toward independence. So the mantra is help me do it myself. When we provide children time to process and when we give them clear limits and boundaries empathy and respect in the process, their peacefulness can grow and grow just from the satisfying accomplishments of being able to be autonomous and do things by themselves. This is sort of the foundation of peace education as well. In the language area, you can support your child's language independence and development by speaking to them in complete sentences. Um, enjoy the silly idiosyncrasies and the fun playful words and sounds that, that you enjoy on your own, but avoid baby talk. Don't put your words into um, a, a different way of speaking just for your child, um, except for the playful part, of course. Um, and try to avoid putting your words in place of your child's, though we're always uh, giving children words to help them um, to model what words they can use. Um, we're going to let them speak and let them develop. Playfully delve into the oral auditory phase. Uh, we model for the children listening to the sounds we make when we speak um, and really playing with the sounds that we hear by changing the words to songs and other wordplay games. And in these games and in all of our oral auditory work in the classroom, we focus on the sounds themselves, not the letter names. And so you can support that development at home by doing the same. And of course, just enjoying literature, a story for a story's sake. Read to the children, wonder about the story together, and avoid quizzing your child about words or letters that they find, but instead just explore open-ended conversations and characters, what they might be feeling, what might happen, and uh, why a funny story is funny. That's a really great one for this age. Um, have a little anecdote for you uh, of where language and independence in language meets the social emotional. Um, and it's someone who was just kind of at the very top or end of that plane, that first plane of development. It was a six year old um, 
first grader, and, and I went, when I met this child for the first time, I could just say, we'll just call him Jake for this sake, um, not his real name. I greeted Jake and I paid him a compliment that his hair looked really great that day. And this was a get to know you session at the school. It was the first time this child had ever met me. And rather than speaking to me, this six year old went, rawr. <laughs> and so what happened next was the interesting part. Immediately, without hesitation, the parent apologized in the child's stead and said, I'm sorry he does that sometimes, right in front of the child so that he could hear. And I thought that was, I, I thought it was interesting. I realized though it was a choice and I think all parents can realize this can, this is a moment that can be a choice because that parent at that moment by intervening and replacing her words for the child's, what kind of messages could she be giving to her child about grace and courtesy and about their own autonomy in communication? Um, yes, she did, uh, she did model apologizing. And there are lots of times when we simply can, all we can do is model apologizing <laughs> because the children might not be ready to do it themselves. But I also think that um, in that opportunity, she may have missed realizing that she wasn't giving him practice of practicing grace and courtesy or trying apologizing on their own or even just um, the simple guidance of saying what words would you like to say <laughs> when you're meeting this person um, so it helps if you can consider um, consider that that's the reason we say we're not going to replace our actions for the child we're going to try and guide them so that they can grow into doing it themselves Feeding off of that and talking more about grace and courtesy, um, this is the imitation of polite and courteous behavior that leads to an internalization of these considerate actions. So kind of going off of Katie's story, um, something that the family could do together at home is talking about ways to say hello or to greet people. Um, you can shake hands and you don't have to use any words at all or wave hello or, you know, a variety of ways um, to greet. Um, other examples include practicing how to interrupt someone or get someone's attention. Um, in the classrooms, we have plenty of opportunities to share a meal together. Um, here at Greentown, we say when you eat, you sit. Um, and we encourage families to do the same at home, um, to build that bridge, that homeschool connection. Uh, because the more often they get to practice it, it then just becomes second nature. Um, and um, going into practical life, um, this is a very large area in the um, classroom environments where the process is the goal rather than the product. It is the repetition of the material and these tasks which will then lead to mastery. And it is an area of the room that helps the child build concentration, coordination, independence, and order. So while Many adults will say, why are they spooning over and over again? Um, it's the same thing as when we go home and we want to watch Bravo <laughs> or <laughs> reality TV. It's something mindless. And they might have done a huge challenging work and then they go to practical life and they're just spooning beans. Um, and so they have something that they don't have to think about doing, they already know how to do it. Or for the child that needs that practice, um, you know, the guides are there to oh, you know, we do it this way, or silently um, modeling how we do it, or um, redirecting the child who can't seem to focus or is wandering, we guide them to practical life um, to refine those skills. Um, some ways to support this at home, um, making healthy snack choices accessible for your child and setting the expectations around that. Um, I. I like to tell parents that like we're in charge of making the choices that they get to choose. So there isn't this free-for-all that I think sometimes when you hear Montessori, it's, oh, children have this freedom to do whatever. And it's freedom within limits, where we as the adult get to set those limits and those boundaries of what that looks like. Um, involve your child in uh, chores that need to be done around the home. They are... Um, they take care of the environment at school, um, and they want to be a part of their community. So this is something that um, we find ways for them to be successful, to be able to do it at home. They may carry the laundry basket to the washer and dryer. Um, they're moving clothes over um, 
for folding napkins and towels, and I can give examples of those as we show these materials. Um, and then consider setting up a small space for your child to invite peace. Just a small corner or just a, even a pillow or a blanket, just a little area where it is all of their own, that they can go um, and invite peace and kind of, kind of zen out, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and then the last area I want to highlight is sensorial. And this is where we offer experiences that aid in the refinement of the senses. Um, ways to support this um, in the home are to observe, observe, observe. Observe your child. Um, this is how you get to know them um, in learning their interests, what their needs are, what they desire. Um, and we, I think sometimes as adults we find that we need to fill the quiet. If we're not talking to them, then they're not getting the language or they're not getting this. And I think there's beauty in the silence sometimes um, of where that's when they are taking in the world around them and they're noticing all of these different experiences. Um, so, you know, when you're walking around, like take in the sights and the smells and then maybe you talk about it later on um, where then you can notice the similarities or the differences. Um, and this is something that you don't have to just do when you're out walking or at the grocery store. It could also be in the books that you read um, and things that are around the home. Um, so now we're going to go into, I guess, more workshop <laughs> type things. Yeah. Well, just, it's, it's a little more talking and then um, after Olivia has some show and tell, then I get to show you <laughs> pickle serving. So that's right. Oh, and by the way, I did want to let you know that the, um, the child I, I share the story about Jake, is in college or beyond by now and has totally mastered greeting people with <laughs> lovely and grace and courtesy, growling. just say, yeah. Um, so even if you say, your hair looks great, totally, totally <laughs> take it. just really does well with that now. Um, <laughs> so um, this one was great when, when we, we have shared this workshop before and I invite you to consider how much this scenario of the way that children arrive here at school matches how they come and go at home. Because then you get to think about if you put some thought into it and a little planning, you could arrange an area for your child's things to make um, going out and coming home equally independent. So when, um, when a child arrives, they hang their coat on a hook. They place their lunch and their show and tell or their spare clothing if they brought it in that day, and other items they brought, they put those in the right locations. They change into their inside shoes, and they wash their hands. Then they come into the classroom, they say hello to their friends, they greet each other, and they choose their first work of the day, or they remember or have a friend or a teacher remind them their work from yesterday, and that's when they really get going with their work cycle. It's a pretty, it seems like a pretty complex series of tasks um, just, just for arriving and a lot of executive functioning skills. Um, but as Olivia was saying, it's, it's the environment that facilitates and supports that. It's the routine um, and having, it's, it's like mise en place for the first plane of development. You just have things where they belong and the child um, knows where to find them. Um, so, I'm going to share some examples of, I guess these would fall into more dressing skills, um, and how to support children in being more independent. Um, this is more toddler specific, I, I mean it still happens in primary, but um, for example, indoor shoes. Um, so the ones I have here are typically what we find most often in toddler. Um, it's the one Velcro. Um, and so maybe the beginning stage for toddler, they're just learning to open and close their shoe. And oftentimes we'll find that they're sitting at their cubby and maybe they're just opening and closing it over and over again. Or they just want to sit and try taking their shoes on and off. Um, and we allow that to happen because, as we said, practicing things ad nauseum is when they then learn, though, I, I know how to put my shoes on now. Um, so ways that we can support this, if the child doesn't have the strong, fine motor skill, we might start the Velcro for the child so that they can then open it independently. Um, 
we invite them to put their toes in first. Um, for the child who might still be struggling to put their foot all the way in, you might put your finger in the back so that they can slide their foot in. Um, and then many times they're very quick to close it on their own. <laughs> um, and so those are just different ways of supporting um, a child putting on their shoes independently. Um, I think what's really important too is allowing the time for them to put their shoes on. So when you're racing to get out of the house, it's not the best time to practice putting shoes on and off. Um, so maybe on a rainy day, they could sit and practice putting their shoes on and off. Um, and then, you know, building in that time, you know that it's going to take a little bit longer trying to build that time into your routine when it's time to go home or time to leave the house. Um, and I think sometimes as adults, it's very easy for us to get frustrated and we say, you got to put your shoes on, we got to go, put your shoes on, put your shoes on. And for a small child, that can be very overwhelming and when they're not quick to do it. So I challenge you to give wait time. You ask your child, put your shoes on, it's time to put your shoes on, it's time to go. And wait, count to 10 in your head because oftentimes children will start doing it a little bit longer than what, you know, is our timeline, but they will start doing it. For the child who might need to be redirected, just say shoes. And then they can problem solve, oh, like, I need to go and get them. I need to put them on my feet. Um, so it kind of breaks it down to where they are able to problem solve um, next steps. Yeah, sure. These are wonderful for primary too because um, I found in my many years with children that it's around age five or six when their dexterity is really getting ready to start to have a bow tying lesson and learn how to tie these shoes. So um, it just allows them to do it by themselves instead of relying on an adult to help them with their shoes each time. Um, and then the last thing I want to add about dressing skills, um, and it's the perfect season now where we're wearing coats and jackets, um, is the flip over. Um, I guess I can use my sweater. <laughs> um, yeah, it's fine. I might stand over here, though. Um, so, so we have the child lay their jacket on the floor, and we say toes to tag, um, and then invite them to put their hands all the way into the sleeves and hold tight, and then they can flip it over their head to put their jacket. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, just a quick little anecdote, and I think Sarah was with me when I when I saw this happen the other day at dismissal. There was a kindergartner who was juggling all the things, and we were reminding her, "Oh, it's cold out. You might want to put your coat all the way on." And you know, we we love the flip over method, so we encourage. And she's like, "Oh, I don't need to do that anymore. I can put my arm behind my back, so it's easy for me to put my jacket on." And it was just very sweet to see that whole progression of being with toddler where they're so excited to do the flip over and they did it all by themselves to the kindergartner who's like, oh, that's for babies. Like, <laughs> I don't need the flip over method anymore. Um, my own right. <laughs> I figured out how to put my coat on um, like adults do. So it's very, very sweet to see that uh, full circle moment. Um, I just want to highlight a few food prep utensils. Um, for the sake of this recording, and then we'll end with um, Katie's food prep lesson. So as we mentioned throughout this presentation, um, of thinking about ways to set up your home environment so that the child is their most successful self. Um, the biggest thing that I think in our classroom environments are having things available at the child's level. So command hooks are your best friend. I would say almost every classroom here has them in use. Um, Baskets are great. Um, I use this basket of towels by the sink. Um, and then having a little laundry basket where they can then um, carry things to the laundry room. Um, an example of a place setting. Um, these are toddler dishes that I believe primary is somewhat similar, maybe a larger cup. Um, but like I said before, like when the child is finished eating, they carry it. Um, where they can then wash it themselves or just place it in the sink. Um, and there is that control of error if it drops, it breaks, or it makes a loud noise. Um, so whatever you use, just consider that there is you know, a, a noise. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that breaks, but um, something that's a little jarring to where, <laughs> um, you know, they use the two hands. And the, you know, when that happens, like, oh, I, I'll try not to do that again. Um, so that's our place setting. And then 
here on the tray, um, I just, oh, I think this is the primary glass yes. size, so for reference. Um, and then here I've just provided a few different um, dishes and things that can be used. Um, pitchers are great. Uh, to use during meal times, whether it's water, juice, milk, whatever you're drinking. Um, but you as the adult can provide the amount of liquid that the child can then be able to clean up on their own. Of course, we don't want to give them the whole jug. That's going to frustrate you <laughs> more than anything else. Um, so if they are or when they do spill it, they can then go and get a towel and they can clean it up. Um, they see adults doing these things all the time, and that to them is you know, very exciting. They want to be able to be a part of their community. Um, I think oftentimes we see toddlers sweeping instead of playing with the toys that maybe we, or work that we think they'd want to be doing. Um, and then lastly here um, are some tools that we use in the classroom for food prep. Um, the banana slicer, um, this. Uh, we use for apple slicing, but really can be used for any produce or um, anything that needs to be cut. We just remind them that your hands go on the top. For those that are a little bit older, these are great. This little knife set. Um, they and are still sharp. Even the they, are, they are still so sharp, still but you know, know less so than using. Know what they're doing, yeah. <laughs> um, and then the egg slicer. Um, not just for eggs. Boiled <laughs> um, potatoes. Yeah, we use, um, or I've used it for strawberry slicing. Um, so anything soft, olives, mushrooms, whatever. Um, and then the scrub brush is great for table washing. If they um, spill something on the table, um, this is great for that gross motor movement. Um, I think that is all I have. So please show us your. Right. At last, the beloved work of our classroom pickle cutting, pickle serving. I, I sneaked away and washed my hands. Look at the control of movement I have to master just to use these tools. <laughs> and they know to put that back in the fridge. Same color. like a little eagle. <laughs> we'll discard the piece with the stem. Save one for the server <laughs> afterward. Would you like a pickle? life into grace and courtesy. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you very much for coming. That concludes our presentation. <laughs>